Reason being is I think she's, she is a superstar. I think she's going to be looked back when her career's over in many years to come as one of those really famous actresses. It's time for me to thank one of our supporters, and it's Murphy's Gin. Murphy's Gin has been featured in British Vogue. Murphy's Gin, they're a producer of high-quality, small-batch, premium gins and vodkas, and they're made right here in Liverpool on Regent Road in Murphy's Distillery. Check out the links and buy yourself some Murphy's Gin. What a gift that would be. But please remember... Drink responsibly. Thanks again, Murphy's Gin. If you're a Liverpool supporter, you're not going to go into town on a Saturday night and bump into a Liverpool player. That used to happen. <laughs> Guilty. Uh, but you, that, that, those days, they're, they're not happening, you know. I think, you know, Robbie would go out, I'd go out. Stevie a little bit, I don't think he, he, he frequented the town too much. But, you know, you'd... You, you, if you're in town on a Saturday night, you'd probably bump into a footballer at some stage. You know, Liverpool City Centre's only small. I think those days are well, you know, long gone because players, I don't think, go into the city centre for obvious reasons. The players look after themselves a lot more now. So that thing of sort of really getting involved in Liverpool, I'm not sure it happens as much right now mm-hmm. as it did in in my day. You strike me as someone who, who sometimes... You get involved and you get out and about and... and, and you know, your, your profile or your celebrity doesn't seem to stop you doing doing stuff as in a way that maybe it does do with some. I mean, I know Jurgen Klopp in the past had mentioned he just, he finds it impossible or he doesn't yeah. think it's possible to go out in in Liverpool. But but I think you do. And, and is there any particular reason for that? I I, I just think I want to go there and nothing's stopping me. Or you know, I'm in town most days. Basically, I I, I go to the gym and then we all go for our lunch in the city centre. Different places so you're always popping up or parking your car walking to a restaurant might be the city centre Bold Street it could be anywhere you know Georgian Quarter go to Quarter you know it could be anywhere uh, so I, I do like that thing of being in the city centre I always think could I live there I'm not quite sure but I uh, yeah I couldn't be someone who stayed out the way really I mean that's a lot of players move to to Formby Stevie's in Formby Klopp's there and I always think I couldn't I couldn't move that far because I don't think I'd ever go into town. It feels too far. And I just think, no, no, I always need to go. I'm always going that way into town as opposed yeah. to going to a, a Formby Southport way. So, no, I, I like being in the city centre. Uh, maybe not nights out as such, uh, really. I don't think I'd probably go out too much now, city centre-wise, of an evening. But in terms of the day, I'm, I'm probably in there three or four times a week. Well, what do you like to do in your, in your downtime, not, not football-related? What do I do? I mean, I'm quite busy, to be fair. There's not that much downtime, uh, really. I'm in London quite a lot with the, with the TV stuff. Uh, I do like that sort of, you know, doing something different, you know, not always being in, in Liverpool. Uh, but I go to the gym. You know, I, I class that as downtime, going to the gym most mornings with the lads in the rotunda, going for our lunch. And then, you know, you're getting in, aren't you? Two, three, four o'clock. And before you know, there's a game on, isn't it? Eight o'clock. Is the road under where you put Gary Neville through his paces? Yeah, 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 yeah. He said he couldn't be broken. Yeah, he was then called a Kit Kat. <laughs> every, every time you do one of those um, one of those challenges with Gary Neville on Sky Sports, you, you always seem to win. Is that true? Of course. What do you expect? You're just a little fat mank. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jamie, um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a comedian. I like a bit of a laugh and a joke. Who were the, some of the funniest players you played with? DD Man was funny. He used to make me laugh. Peppy Rain was a big character as well. Uh, Danny Murphy, he'd always give me a little chuckle and a giggle, really. I'm just trying to think if there's any foreign players, really. Uh, Peppy was a big character. Danny was funny with the one liners. And Dee Dee was just almost just like a bit mad. 
you know, so you'd almost just be laughing at some of the antics or the, the gear he had on or what he'd been up to. And and the fact he was foreign, he still got our humour and wit, you know, he could still, you know, he understood what was going on. Craig Bellamy was hilarious. He was very funny. Uh, as long as it wasn't you who was on the air, the sharp end of his tongue. But uh, Did he ever come for you, Bellamy? I think we had a couple of little ones, a little bit of banter. We were arguing about how good he was as a player. So we winded him up. And everywhere he'd been, he'd been loved. You know, he'd played for a lot of clubs. And he said to me, name one club where they don't sing my name. And I went, Liverpool. <laughs> he went, all right, besides Liverpool, <laughs> name one. <laughs> ended, ended by JC23. Yeah. Um, Jamie, we're going to have to have a quick break, I think. We're going to make you a, a, a cup of tea. Um, I got you a chocolate bar, mate. I don't Ooh. know where this came from. I, I followed me intuition. And I went for caramel milk. So once you've had a word with someone, haven't you? I have, yeah. 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 What, are you into it? Oh, I love it. Yeah? It's it's taking over now. Yeah? Yeah, C- C- Cara Milk from Cadbury's is now the number one. The buttons, or the big slab, no matter what you want. And it's not Chocolate just not, for not me. Just, not just because it's Cara. I, well, maybe there's a little bit of link there. I kid some of the uh, nieces and nephews uh, that uh, it's my company, and that's why they've got to you know keep buying me. Uh, but chocolate has to go in the fridge. I can't have that like melted boy. chocolate for me. You've, you've got to, when you're eating a chocolate bar or one of those big slabs, you've got to have that snap, you know, that like, mm. it's, it's, uh, no. Cho- chocolate has to go in the fridge. Well, listen, if anyone's listening from Cadbury's, <laughs> you just did the man, uh, send Caramel. us some money or, or free chocolate. We'll, yeah, take, yeah. we'll take both, um, ideally. But we're going to go to a quick uh, half time break with Jamie Carrigan. We'll be back. with Jamie Carragher we've just had half time Jamie what were you like at half time I used to always change my shirt always uh, and then in the end the whole team started changing the shirt Copy, you know, just cop- to hate copycats yeah yeah a little bit but it was just if it, if it improves the performance I want the rest of the lads to be alright as well but that thing of like you're sweating in the first half and you get a bit cold and you're going out with the shirt and I just think you feel like you're starting the game again you're just like a, a fresh shirt I wouldn't say you, you wouldn't got a shower, but you know, dry yourself off, get a shirt on. Yeah, and to be honest, I wouldn't be quite very animated at half time or nothing like that. Not really. I was never big, and I always thought players were a little bit. Sometimes I could see through them a little bit. You know those players who scream and shout in the dressing room and then don't say a word on the pitch. I was probably the opposite of that. You know, I'd say a little few words before we went out. Come on, you know, like, but not in like screaming and shouting. You know, I. Uh, but I used to scream and shout on the pitch, but very rarely. Before the game, after the game, or half time, no. Intimidating atmospheres. You're talking there about shouting on the pitch in direct. We all were a leader on, on the pitch. What, what what was the most intimidating atmosphere to, to play in? I, I would say, I would probably say Turkey. Turkey or Greece. Yeah, you know, when you go to like an, an Olympiakos, uh, there was, you know, you're thinking, oh, an hour before the game, you go out and have a look at the pitch, you know, mm. European game. Turkey was the same, Besiktas, Galatasaray, you know, like, it's not so much the game, because lots of places can have a great atmosphere when the game starts, but you know, when, like, you're thinking, this is lively, even like an hour before the game in the warm-up, and you're thinking, oh, this is, you know, this could go off here. Uh, so I, I'd say those places, but I loved it. And I, I never went into a game of football nervous about the game because of the crowd I might be nervous a little bit or a, bit, a little bit of trepidation because of who you're playing against and you think you might lose or you're thinking oh this could be a tough game but never with the you know the surroundings well I wanted to ask you that as well in terms of opposition obviously we talked about scousers not really being shrinking violets and shaking from a challenge but what what players did you have a, a sense of um, uh, oh I'm in for a battle here against Eh. Uh, there was probably only one it was a little bit like that I think for Thierry Henry for a couple of years but it wasn't just Thierry Henry it was that Arsenal team they were the best team I played against 
a home or abroad. They never won a Champions League, they won a couple of leagues, but around 2002, 2004, around that era, I think that was when that Arsenal team were at their absolute best. And that was like, you'd stand in the tunnel, every one of them felt like 6-3, lightning quick, brilliant players technically. And it was a little bit like, even before you were going out, you're thinking, how can you win this game? You know, how, how can we, you know? Uh, certain other teams, you think, you know, they're better than us, but you think we can, you know, put our foot in, make it tough for them. There was a couple of years with that Arsenal team and it was a little bit going into games thinking, oh, I'm not sure where the weakness is here or what you can get the better of. And, and one day we actually beat them when uh, Neil Mellor got the goal. Rafford had just come and they were on this unbeaten run for so long. I think they'd lost the week before and we might have caught them on a bad day. And then and then all of a sudden, because you win that game, a little bit of belief kicks in that you can beat them the next. So that's just the way it is in football. But I'd only say him, really. I, I wouldn't be intimidated by players. I always felt when I was a player, if I had a bad game, it had nothing to do with who I was playing against. It was because of me. It wasn't like, oh, I played bad. Because sometimes I, I could accept if a striker did something special, I know a fan might go, oh, that goal he scored against you. But like, what, what did you want me to do? You know, I, you know. sometimes you've got to go, fair enough. But if I had a bad game, I'd always think it was me, mm. not like an opposition player or nothing like that. On the flip side, what what, were, what was the easiest atmosphere to play in? What, what, what stadium did you did you actually quite enjoy going to and thought, you know what, we, we always do well here? Probably Goodison, I would say, because... When you you class Everton as a rival, obviously, alongside a Chelsea or a United or an Arsenal, but they weren't as good as those teams. So even when you were going to their grounds, intimidating atmosphere, almost like a derby game at Old Trafford, but also top quality players. So it was always going to be difficult to win there. But with Everton, it was that atmosphere, it was a derby game, but we were better than them. And you always knew that. So we had a great record there in terms of winning. I think we won there, actually. At one stage, you think of all the success that people had in the 70s and 80s, but I think under Gerard Houllier, we won there four years in a row, which was a record. You know, probably even Jürgen Klopp's Liverpool now don't haven't done that. Uh, so, yeah, we had a great record at Everton. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I used to love going to Goodison. Yeah, great atmosphere. You mentioned Thierry Henry, one, yeah. one of now many um, colleagues in, in sports mm. broadcasting. One of the things that strikes me when I watch you on, on Sally, Jamie, is you're talking a lot about about the stats in football and all the rest of it. Is, are you passionate about data? Is that something that you enjoy looking into nowadays? Yes, but I, I never want to lose the the eye test. Basically, you know what I what I see with my eyes. I I, I don't I, I think a lot of people now on social media, it almost feels to me like they look at the stats first and goes, Well, that must have meant he played well. You know. I'll always watch the game first and want the stats to back me up. And nine times out of ten, it does. You, you know, you, you don't need to look at the stats first. You, you watch the game of football, but you know, you know what stood out to you. I mean, the one who, who was just, I, I could never get my head around, Keita. I mean, I'd watch a game for Liverpool and think he, he's offered nothing there. And then someone posts his numbers on social media and I go, well, they're up there, obviously true, but I'm like, I didn't see that. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? He was one of those players who was a great sort of stats player. But it just, if, if you went to match and watched me, you're like, nah. You know, but I don't, I'd, I'd always go with the eye test first. But the game is very stat based. It, you know, we all crunch the numbers in terms of what top players do, what they need to do to be a top player. They need to, you know, so many goals, so many assists, so many recoveries, how many times they play the ball forward, all this. And because the clubs use that in terms of data to sign players, if I'm involved in talking about football, I need to be doing that. So I am passionate about it, but I'm passionate about it because we've got to be on our TV shows giving the viewer something that is going on in the football clubs. It's like, a, you know, this is what's going on right at your football club or somebody else's. This is what they're looking for and this is how they go about scouting players and buying players. Switching gear a little bit, every time you're on telly in my house, my, yeah. well, no, let's scrap that. When I go round for Sunday dinner in my mum's, <laughs> she always says, 
Isn't Jamie Carragher looking smart these days? Yeah. These days? <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't Jamie Carragher always looked smart? So yeah, she said, yeah. No, but seriously, Jamie, there is a, there is a culture of, of fashion in, in, in Liverpool and Scouse style and all the rest of it. Is that something that, that you big into and, and you believe in? Yeah, I think we're a law unto ourselves. I, uh, I actually get all my stuff off TV from uh, someone in Liverpool, uh, Sato. Uh, so yeah give, Sato. yeah, give them a little mention. So they're all my suits, yeah. Keep it in the city. But uh, I think in this city, we, we obviously get a lot of stick from outside, don't we, for you know, different reasons. But there's always this idea that people in Liverpool, you know, don't care or sort of something about the way they dress. You won't get many smarter people in Liverpool. You know, or people who take real pride in their appearance, whether so, someone thinks it's smart or not. You know, there's a few uh, fashion fuck-ups uh, everywhere, isn't he? But... Yeah, you know, you see the girls out on a Saturday night, everyone goes for it, don't they? Sometimes it might be all over the top with the lads and the girls, but everyone goes for it, you yeah. know. Uh, and even a big thing in Liverpool is Christmas clothes. I remember saying that to Michael Owen, he'd never heard of it. <laughs> I'd say, you don't get Christmas clothes. He said, no, just get clothes when I need them. What do you mean? I said, well, don't you get a set of clothes, for, a new clothes for Christmas and Boxing Day? He said, no, just put like, the gear that I've got upstairs. I was like, oh, fucking hell's going on here? You know, your Christmas trainees, you know, that was a big thing when I was a kid. What trainees are you getting for Christmas? Yeah. They were almost like a present, weren't they? They, they were. were. What, what do you reckon then, little, little, the Scouse House, Jamie Carragher, T-shirt merchandise? Do you think that would fly off the shelves? I, I'm, I'm sure it would be a great competition because I think Jamie Carragher is the only person in Liverpool who doesn't sell T-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no. Is there anyone who doesn't sell T-shirts in Liverpool? <laughs> okay, yeah, no. yeah. Remember to like and subscribe to the Scouts House podcast. Is that okay, Ant? Is that right? Thank you. If you would like to see some of the best new comedians in the Northwest, get yourself down to Laugh Hard Comedy at Rock Salt, hosted by me, Andy Roach, AJ.Rochi. Laughhard.co.uk for tickets. I'll see you there. Jamie, let's get into it. Let's get serious now. Your top scousers. It's part of the show, everyone. Yeah. Wants to hear from you. You pick three. Yeah. You run them by me. You give me the uh, the seal of approval. Seal of approval, and let's get let's get into uh, the first scouser of your top scousers. In at number three. In at number three, I am going to go with someone who was based onto the scene, shall we say, in the last sort of uh, four or five years. I'm going to go for Jodie Comer. Uh, the reason being is I think she's, she is a superstar. I think she's going to be looked back when her, her career's over in many years to come as one of those really famous actresses from this uh, from this country, like it was it Helen Mirren or uh, Judy Dench or something like that. I, I think she'll be looked at like that and we should all be proud that she's come from our city. Everything she touches t- seems to turn to... Uh, Gold right now when she's on TV, always getting awards and, you know, going over to America, being on talk shows. I mean, how amazing is that? You know, the biggest talk shows in the world that there's a, there's a girl from Liverpool as an actress now who's got, on, you know, going on all these shows. Everybody wants to speak to her and uh, intrigued to see where she uh, where she goes next. So she's going to go in at number three. Okay, and and yeah, and Jodie, if you if you're around, yeah, you can come on the scouts. You get, you get on the podcast, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Number two. Number two, I'm going to go with Ken Dodd. Uh, wow. Wow, yeah. Well, you know, we all think we're comedians in this uh, in this city, so uh, I'm going to have to go for the numero uno in that uh, department, Ken Dodd. And, uh, John Bishop gutted that hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, no, 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 no. <laughs> just, un, just underneath uh, Ken. You, you'd take that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Both got great teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Ken Dodd's dad's dog's dead. I'm <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. So Ken Dodd's why? Well, for that reason, it's with a city full of comedians. He's the number one. He's got a stat. Where is that? It's the Statue of Lime Street, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, yeah. So I get the train quite a lot. So I feel like I see him. I feel like I know him. I see him uh, most Monday mornings going down to Sky. But no, I had a couple of encounters with him. He he uh, he wouldn't have had a clue who I was at the time. But uh, I remember going to a football dinner. 
I think it was for the for the Echo, and I was I was on a table, and you know when you 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 go in and the big boards about twenty tables, and you're trying to find your name, and I was stood with Sammy Lee, and uh, little fella, little Sammy Lee, yeah. And he said to her, Sammy, what table are you under? <laughs> <laughs> Just a little one-liner uh, to Sammy Lee, yeah. So it was, uh, yeah, he was, he was great company, yeah. You know, big character. And again, known nationwide, worldwide. And, you know, the, uh, so I'm one of the Doddy men. Jamie Carragher, the Doddy man. And we need a bit of drum roll. Number one is Paul McCartney. It's got to be. It's, it, I think if you're picking this, I, I don't know how, who else has picked this, but it always feels to me it'd have to be Paul McCartney or John Lennon at the top of this list. We're going to have to start, you know, capping people, uh, one beetle or something Yeah, yeah, like that. yeah, I, I would do that. I would do that. But uh, I'd go with Paul McCartney. I would say I've, I've met him once. When I say met him, I, uh, I bumped into him at the... Was the MTV Awards here about 2008? Eight. Yes. So the Liverpool, as, as a team, we were allowed in like the VIP area and I just got him in the headlock, uh, made sure I got a picture as he was coming <laughs> off stage. So I got a picture, sweat was fucking rolling off me. Uh, so I got him there. I I actually went to watch, I've, I've seen him a few times in concert, but one of the best ones I went to was in the cavern. This must have been about uh, two or three years ago. So he was actually playing that night in the Echo Arena. So he almost wanted to warm up or do this like secret gig. So it, I just found out in the morning, someone from the council told me Paul McCartney was basically playing on uh, Matthew Street in the cavern. So, but he, he went, Does, you can't bring anyone. It's just only you. So I, I just rocks up and Peter Newton's there. And he said, I, I, I can't get anyone. I, I, you know, you're only allowed in on your own. I went, oh, you know what I mean? But I bumps into someone from Bootle. Danny O'Leary, outside. He was just floating about in his work here. Like the fog. Yeah, yeah, in. just come floating around as Danny normally does. And, uh, all right, lad. You know, one of them ones. And, uh, what are you doing? I'm, I'm doing this. I ends up getting a plus one. I was the only one who got a plus one. It was Danny O'Leary. Yeah. And, uh, but we're in there, there's no phones. No one's allowed to video. You, but you're stood there. It's almost surreal. There's about... I don't know, maybe 100 people in the little stage in the cavern. Paul McCartney's playing all the records he's going to play that night. And uh, next thing, I just turns around, Danny's getting turfed out because he's on his phone. <laughs> next thing, he comes flying back in. I went, what the fuck happened there? He said, I was on the phone. And he said, I forgot about the, you know, the rules or whatever. And when the fella threw me out, I went, it's me bitch, she's in the hospital, she's just having the baby. Classic. <laughs> well, that's the go-to excuse, isn't it? Oh, you got to let you back in for that one, you haven't you? have got to let yeah. you back in. Just Jamie. checking how she was. Well, there we go. There's the, the, there's the top three. Before before we let you, you uh, get off, I just wanted to mention, you have been picked okay. as as someone's top scouser or one of the top scousers. Oh, so what? So, well, oh, where's the come? It doesn't matter where you came. Yeah. <laughs> it's you taken honor- part. You, you were, yes, <laughs> it was. Uh, it was an honor- honorary mention from um, Fran Doran, lead, oh. lead singer of the Red Room Club. Are oh, you a brilliant. Red Room Club fan? Massive fan. Know the lads well. Yeah, they helped me out, or, or help, were helping my daughter out uh, writing songs a few years ago. Yeah, they were uh, a big help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know they'll be gigging in the summer, so I'm sure you'll. Yeah, they've they going in uh, New York and they're, they're all over the place, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And uh, in terms of Paul McCartney, you, you're listening to uh, you music fan nowadays, Beatles, bit of what? What you'd have on the? What would I the have radio? on now? I, I, if I was if I was going in the gym and just on my own and put music on, I'd put the greatest hits of the Beatles on. I would. I do. I listen to that quite a lot. I don't. I'm, I'm not a massive music fan. I must say, but I, I would listen to the Beatles, and I do think the the TV series or whatever it was. On, I think it's on Apple with uh, with the Beatles, the behind the scenes footage. Yeah. I mean, I watched that. I was just mesmerised watching that. I mean, it went on for hours. It was about twelve hours. Of I don't can't remember what it was, but that was some of the most fast. I was just like, wow. You know, watch. Have you watched it? Yeah. No. I'll watch it. I will it, do. It's unbelievable watching the Beatles write songs and how they went about things. One of the greatest pieces of TV, yeah. and uh, you'll see. And I, I do agree. I think the greatest hit of the Beatles was their best album, for sure. 
Sergeant Pepper. That's the Scouts album. That's the Scouts album. Thank you very much, Jamie, for coming in. Little known fact: there's a bonus episode available. This is the second time Jamie's done this because yeah. he's, he's just such a legend. He such, helps people out. And he, that, he basically told a shit joke in the first one. He wants to do it again. Yeah, yeah. Sign it. <laughs> Sign up to listen. Sign up to listen to that. Jamie, take care, mate. Describe Pete Price to someone who isn't from Liverpool. What is Pete Price? Price is a Scouse legend. Um, and no one really knows whether he likes being called a lizard or not. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>